neighborhoods. The reason those are crazy is that they deal with the difference between light and particles. So it seems fairly clear to us that light and particles are two different things, right? Like, you can see a beam of light, it has certain properties. You see particles, they have different properties. And in all of human experience up until this point, that was pretty much true. So first of all, let's start, at, let's start originally. What is the difference between a wave and a particle? Or how can you tell that those are actually different? How do we tell that a, that a wave has a different behavior from a particle? Anybody know? It has to do with that top figure there. Yeah, it kind of has to do with how things pat. Well, one of the f there are several ways, but w one important difference that was discovered early on was how they pass through what we call slits, just small, tiny spaces. Um, and then what happens when there are some subsequent slits? So when a wave hits a slit, you can imagine it kind of bowing out in the middle and passing through the middle faster than the outsides. The way I like to think about that is think about like waves in the ocean. If you imagine a bunch of waves in water coming up against a barrier and there's a hole in the middle of the barrier, the, it's going to kind of push out through the hole and you're going to get these arced things coming out past it. And then imagine you're shooting particles through a hole. All right, so see if I can. No, oh, I can't actually link things in here. Okay, good. So what that looks like on paper is this. This is a figure from your book. You see a light source that radiates out these waves, these light waves. They pass through the slits, and then the waves interfere with each other. Because you remember, waves kind of look like this, right? And so if the two tops meet, they amplify each other. That's constructive interference. If a top and a bottom meet, they cancel each other out. That's destructive interference. So what you have is that as these, where these things constructively interfere, it makes bright spots. Where they destructively interfere, it makes black spots. So if you shine a beam of light through two slits that are spaced, spaced on the order of the wavelength of that light, what you'll see on the other side is a kind of a pattern of lines, bright and dark, bright lines. If you, um, if you do the same thing, but let's say you have like slits going this way and going this way, then you'll see dots in different ways. But you'll see this kind of, th this kind of thing out the other side, and that's called a diffraction pattern. Whereas if you shoot particles through a slit, you just see where the particles go through, and that's it. So it was pretty clear for you know, 50 years or more that, um, I guess a little more, that waves and particles were clearly different. You had electromagnetic radiation, which caused waves, that is light. And then you had particles, which was everything from protons, electrons, atoms, baseballs, you know, whatever. Those are particles. They behave like particles. We knew that waves uh, can be described using a certain set of equations. Um, you, can, you can use equations to figure all this stuff out, how these things space, and how they diffract based on the slit widths and all this stuff. And then we know a bunch of equations for how particles behave based on Newtonian physics. Like if you shoot a ball with this much force going this direction, it'll, we can calculate where it's going to end up, all that kind of stuff, trajectories and forces and all of that. So we had these two separate sets of physics to describe separate things, to describe light and then to describe behavior of particles or of matter. And the big problem with this or the big thing that came up that made those equations so um, earth-shattering was that those equations suggest that light and matter actually can be described by the same set of equations. So we don't need separate physics for light and for matter. We can actually use a new set called quantum physics or quantum mechanics to describe both. And what that really means, which makes it crazy, or not crazy, but makes it made it unbelievable at the time, was that Waves and particles are essentially the same thing. That is, every particle can be described as a wave, even like a baseball. And every wave can be described as a particle. So a beam of light isn't just a wave. It's also a bunch of particles of light, which was a completely new idea. And 
really had no evidence at the time until a couple things came up. So the first thing that came up, we're going to talk about two different experiments. Um, one is a, a thing that proves that light is actually a particle, and then one is a thing that proves that particles can actually be waves. So let's go back to our video first and talk about how particles can be waves. We talked about nu is a frequency, lambda is a wavelength, c is a speed of light. We're going to talk about h in a minute. So the other part of this, that was, so that was an experiment that said that, uh, or that showed that electrons can actually act as waves. And in fact, the opposite thing also occurred. That is, there was another experiment actually earlier that showed that waves also act as particles. And it's something called the photoelectric effect. Does anybody know what the photoelectric effect is? The photoelectric effect, and this effect was actually known, but there was something odd about it that wasn't explained until later. That doesn't, wasn't explained until quantum theory. So if you have a, a metal, and most metals do this, all metals do this, and light shines on that metal, electrons will be ejected out of the metal. Okay. Metals do this. It's a property. You transfer, metal, you transfer energy into the um, metal, and it releases that energy by basically releasing an electron. So that's called the photoelectric effect. And this was known for some time. It's, it was used um, up until just recently with transistors as, as detectors in most types of instruments because you could detect um, light that way and then have it amplified. Anyway, that, that's it's different. But the weird thing about this is not that it happens. That was fine. Here's the weird thing. Let's take a sample. Let's take a piece of metal. Two of them, same thing. You could shine extremely intense red light on that metal. You know, super, super bright, intense light. Nothing happens. Doesn't eject any electrons. And then, the same metal, you shine a very, very weak ray of blue light, and the electrons come out. So a very strong red light didn't release any electrons. But a very weak blue light did release the electrons. And if light is just a wave, that doesn't make any sense. If light's just a wave, then the intensity of that wave should influence the amount of energy that it's transferring. So if you have a very intense light, that should be transferring a lot more energy to the metal than a very weak light, regardless of the wavelength. But if light is a particle, that's not necessarily the case. Because if light is a particle, then each little light particle can be thought of as a packet of energy. And that energy is going to depend on the wavelength of the light. So blue light, which is lower wavelength, higher frequency, will have more energy in that little packet than the red light. And if it's those packets of energy that matter, then the photoelectric effect is explained. And this is actually the work that got Einstein his Nobel Prize. He's more famous now for being associated with things like relativity and e equals mc squared. But it's the photoelectric effect that he described um, using this idea of photons that actually uh, won him the Nobel Prize. So Max Planck was the first to kind of develop this equation. And he didn't actually think it was real. I mean, he didn't think that light was actually particles. He just kind of said, well, we're going to pretend that light's a particle because it makes all this math work out and it makes you know, all of this other stuff explained, and that was fine. But then um, when they started doing the experiments and started looking into it, and, and this is where Einstein came in, he said, no, actually, light really is a particle. It really does behave like a particle. And that light particle is called a photon. 
So a photon is a particle of light, which doesn't sound that crazy because that's a word that we hear a lot now. Um, but think about what that means. That means that the particle has no mass because light has no mass. It's light. And yet you're treating it like a particle, like a piece of matter, even though it has no mass. So how can something be matter and not have mass? Well, that's what's so crazy about this stuff, or what was at the time, is you're essentially saying light is made up of tiny particles of nothing, right? or of light, of energy. Uh, and this came, this then was the big discovery by Einstein that essentially matter and energy are the same thing. So matter, that is mass, particles, and energy, waves, since they can be described in these same ways and thought of in these same ways, they are essentially the same. So we don't have, we no longer have separate realms of physics for particles and for energy, or for matter and for energy. We actually talk about them together as the same thing. Um, so this is the equation for the energy of a photon, or of a, um, of a photon impinging upon, uh, uh, for a certain wavelength or frequency. So the higher the frequency, the higher the energy of that photon. And the lower the wavelength, the higher the energy of that photon. Notice that these two things equal each other because of the last um, thing that we did, which was looking at the wavelength times the frequency is always equal to the speed of light. All right. So this equation is very important. And the H. is Planck's constant, all right, which is a very small number. Six point six two six times ten to the minus thirty four joule seconds. I'll give you that constant, but you need to know these equations. Um, so that, yeah, that's Planck's constant. And it comes up a lot, as we'll see in a bunch of other stuff, but all kind of based on the same idea. Um, so if you know the frequency of light, you know the wavelength of light, you can multiply it by Planck's constant and get the energy of each individual photon of that light. Okay. So essentially, we'll be using this like a conversion factor in many cases, where we could say like how many photons are there in this thing or something like that. Um, we'll do some practice with that later. All right. So the next part of this then is if we can describe energy, that is light, as a particle using this equation, we can describe matter as a wave or particles as waves using this next equation, which is called the, the lambda here is also a wavelength. It's known as the de Broglie wavelength. The h is the same h, but m is mass. And V is velocity of a particle. And this can be anything from um, an electron to a baseball or something like that. But you'll see that it, actually, it, it significantly changes. I'm trying to find the equation here. But it, it's, it significantly it, it tells us why we don't need to care so much about quantum mechanics in the uh, macro scale, that is, in our world that we actually experience. Um, because let's look at this. Let's pretend um, can, if an electron is acting as a wave, we can now calculate its wavelength and therefore its frequency and its energy based on this equation. And we can also do that with macroscopic objects. But here's the thing. So let's say you take a baseball. All right. Let's say you take a 150 gram baseball. Remember, H 
is a tiny, tiny, tiny number. And that v velocity is only going to be, what, a few meters per second, right? If you're throwing a baseball. I mean, it's not going to be anywhere on the order of like 10 to the minus 34, right? It's going to be like some speed, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Anyway, the point is, no matter what you have under here in, in sort of real world um, scenarios, this is going to come out incredibly small. So remember, nanometers are 10 to the negative ninth, right? That's like visible light. The wavelength of an electron is on the order of um, 10 to the negative tenth, 10 to the negative eleventh, okay. that the wavelength of an electron. So if your wavelength is on the order of 10 to the minus 34, that is an inconceivably small wavelength. Okay. That wavelength is like smaller than any sort of cosmic rays or anything, inconceivably small. So what that's saying is effectively these macroscopic objects like bat baseballs and whatever else don't need to be described as waves. I mean, they are, technically. They follow the, the equation. But it's not really useful because their wavelength is so small that they can't really have that effect. So let's go back to our double slit experiment. And they talked about the electrons passing through the slits and interfering, showing an interference pattern and all that. Well, what they didn't say with, um, in that video is that the slits need to be spaced approximately on the order of the wavelength of the light. Right. So if you have light that has a wavelength of 500 nanometers or something, visible light, you need slits that are spaced around that, like on that 100 to 1,000 nanometer scale, micron scale. Okay. Um, if you want to see electron diffraction, you actually need to pass them through a crystal lattice of atoms because most atoms are spaced around 10 to the minus 10 uh, meters apart. Okay. And so in order to see that diffraction, the only thing you can do is actually pass the electrons through a crystal. And then you'll see it. But if you want to see diffraction of baseballs, you essentially have to pass those baseballs through slits that are 10 to the minus 34th uh, meters apart from each other, which is impossible. That's a tiny fraction of the size of an atom. So the idea of um, interference patterns of macroscopic objects is not really something that we ever have to think about or worry about um, because, of, because of that. Right? Because those, you can't possibly get slits that small or that close together. So here's the weird thing. We didn't have enough weird things today. Here's another weird thing. Anybody know what this next equation is? Anybody seen anything like that before? This equation, another very important equation, called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And this is kind of comes from that. Um, that experiment that showed when you tried to measure the electron, you tried to measure where it is, it stopped behaving as a wave and started behaving as a particle again. Well, so what Heisenberg developed was a way mathematically to say something, matter, waves, energy, whatever, yes, they're both particles and they're both waves. There's a particle wave duality, they're both at the same time. But we can only know things about one or the other of those at any given time. So if we know all the details about it as a particle, that is, where it is, where it's traveling, what trajectory it's moving on, then we can't figure anything out about its uh, wave properties. And if we know something about its wave properties or its energy or its momentum, um, then we can't know exactly where it is. So what Heisenberg's uncertainty, uh, or what the equation says, is essentially, this is the uncertainty. The, this is a Greek letter delta, which means the change. So this is the uncertainty in position. 
and this is the uncertainty and velocity. Mass times velocity is momentum, so essentially the position, which is a particle type attribute, and the momentum, which is an energy type or wave type attribute. And the more closely we know the position, the less we know sort of how fast it's going. And the more we know about how fast it's going, the less we know about where it is. All right. So the, the product of those factors has to be greater than the lower limit, which is h, remember this number here, divided by 4 pi. Um, so the, where this becomes important, again, is in very, very small things. Because if m is big, if your mass is, is even, not even big, but like the size of a, a little bigger than an electron, right? The size of a proton, even. Then your uncertainties can still be very, 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 very small and be greater than h over 4 pi, because h is such a small number. So in any, any particle, like a nucleus, that has a reasonable amount of mass, this essentially doesn't matter. We can, we can effectively know its position and velocity. But something incredibly small with very little mass, like an electron, this becomes really important. And so this is going to describe what we talk about in a little bit um, when we talk about orbitals and how electrons behave inside an atom. Because it's sort of constrained by this. Um, and, and we'll see what that means momentarily. All right. Oh, yeah, because I opened it in the other program, too. OK. OK, so let's look at some of this stu other stuff now. So we talked about two experiments that showed that light um, is particle, and the matter can be a wave. The other part of, and then that'll have consequences for electrons in molecules. The other, the other weird thing that happened, uh, that was known at the time but couldn't be explained, was this. This doesn't seem that weird. You got a hydrogen lamp on the left. Anybody know what a hydrogen lamp is? We're going to be, what? Just looks like the picture. Yeah, we're going to be seeing those on Thursday up in lab. But it's just a tube that's got hydrogen gas in it that you put a lot of energy across. It's basically a fluorescent light, but the gas inside is hydrogen. If you do that, it emits light, looks kind of pinkish, like whitish pink. Um, and then if you spread the wavelengths out through a prism, you see something that was not explainable for a long time, and that is a hydrogen spectrum or a line spectrum. So you expect when you see light, you know, some white light or something, you pass it through a prism, it should show a range, a continuous range of wavelengths, like a rainbow, right? You see everything from the blue to the red. Because white light is a combination of these things. But when you excite a particular atom, or a particular, uh, like hydrogen, you don't see that. You see individual lines. So you only see light emitted at very specific, very narrow wavelengths. And that was unexplainable for a while. And so essentially what it, what it says is that only certain energies are allowed. Because remember, each energy corresponds to a wavelength. So if you're only seeing photons coming out of that hydrogen lamp that have specific wavelengths or specific frequencies, then they also only have specific energies, which means only specific energies are allowed. And this was very different from how we thought about matter and how we thought about energy at the time. Um, it doesn't matter how much energy you put through that hydrogen lamp, how much you crank it up, you can never get other wavelengths to come out besides those lines. Um, and that's very different from what we expect. We expect when you heat something up, it gives off light and it gives off all the light. So why, when we have this spectrum, does it only give off these specific lights? And so the idea was, um, this is Niels Bohr, was trying to figure this out. And he said, well, how about this? How about the electrons in the atom are only at specific levels? And what happens when we give them energy, they jump up to a new level, 
and then they fall back to the original level, and that's the, elect that's the energy that we see coming out. Um, and that actually works. So here was kind of his model. The electrons are in these orbits around the nucleus. They're spinning around the nucleus. And they can jump from one orbit to the other based on the energy. So if you give it energy, they jump out to the outer orbits. And then they relax back to the inner orbits and give off that energy as light. And he calculated that the orbits would have to have these energies. They'd have to be this far away. They'd have to meet these, these electrostatic potentials. And he actually solved the hydrogen spectrum. You can use that to calculate the hydrogen spectrum. And the way we do that, the, the, the equation that he came up with was this. The energy of a, have, of a level in a hydrogen atom is this constant times the atomic number squared over the n, which is the, the, the shell number. So you start at n equals 1, which is the innermost shell. And you could say, all right, so the n equals 1 level has n here as 1. It's hydrogen, so z is also 1. z is the nuclear charge. Um, and you, you calculate that out, and so this is the energy of that first level. Then you could calculate the energy of the third level, and you could subtract those and see the difference in energy there and see how that corresponds to the energy of the emitted photon. And that works. So that's our last equation on this sheet. Um, when you excite an electron from an initial level to a final level, or when it relaxes from an initial level up here to a final level down here, um, you can calculate the energy difference. And that energy difference can be converted to a wavelength, and you can actually see the kind of light that would come out. Um, and that's great. So let's try one. It's here. I'll s well, we've got to look at this problem, and then we'll, we'll go back up to it. Right, here, OK. You want to write it down? That's better. All right, everybody write this down if you don't have it out. All right. OK, so here's how we use that equation. These are what the problems would look like. Calculate the energy required to excite the hydrogen electron from n equals 1 to n equals 2. So we're going from the bottom state to the next one. Also, calculate the wavelength of light that must be absorbed by a hydrogen atom in its ground state. The ground state is that lowest n to reach this excited state. So how, what kind of light do you need to shine on it to actually get that electron to do that? So first, we have to figure out the energy difference. And to do that, we just use that equation. So the change in energy equals whatever that number was. So you get you got that? I always forget that one. We'll say 2.18. Oh, yeah, it's negative 2.18. Okay, and remember, okay, you have to be a little bit careful about your negatives and positives here um, because the energies are all calculated as negatives, but we're looking at a change in energy, a delta E, um, and so that change in energy then could be positive or negative, or, or will always be. Um, well, it could be positive or negative depending on how you ask the question. Right? It's like those work and energy problems. So let's plug this in. We're going from n equals 1 to n equals 2. So that's going to be 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 1 squared. Um, NF is the final 
F for final and I is for initial. So it's going to be the final one wherever it ends up minus the initial one. The other answer to that question is it doesn't matter as long as you get the sign right later. So you can, you can put them in however, but then make sure you read the question again and say, all right, are we going up in energy or are we going down in energy? If we're going up, if we're going up from a lower energy to a higher energy, that's going to take energy, so delta E is positive. If we're going from a higher level to a lower level, that's an em emitting energy, so delta E should be negative. So as long as you keep that in mind, it doesn't matter which one you put where. Um, wait, this is not right. Oh, yeah, that's right, because 1 minus a quarter. Negative 3 quarters, so what does that come out to? Do you have that? Hmm? And that's joules. All right. So that's the amount of energy that it takes to promote an electron from the n equals 1 to n equals 2 in the hydrogen atom. Um, so now we need to calculate the wavelength of light that has that energy. Which equation do we use for that? How do we get a wavelength of light from an energy? Right, that's going to be that energy of the photon. So E equals H nu or HC over lambda. We know the energy, that's 1.63 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. And we know H. And we know C. <laughs> and so we can solve for lambda. Um, or 121 nanometers. Yeah, nanometers is 10 to the, yeah, this should be negative, sorry. Planck's constant? Should be 6.626. All right, and this, so this actually works. If you shine, now 121 nanometer light is in the UV, so you can't see it. But if you shine that light on the hydrogen atom, you're going to um, promote it from n equals 1 to n equals 2. And if, it, if an electron falls from n equals 2 to n equals 1, it will emit a photon. That is, it'll give off light at 121 nanometers. So this, this works nicely, and it correctly, correctly pre predicts quantized energy. And so that's why this falls in the same realm of quantum mechanics, is essentially what Bohr is saying is that energy isn't continuous. You can't like excite hydrogen and get more or less energy out. You can only get it in these little packets. And these little packets have to have specific energies and specific wavelengths. Right? Um, and then as the electron gets closer to the nucleus, the energy is lower. And that works because it makes sense electrostatically. But there are some big problems with the Bohr model. Um, so there's our equation again. We'll get back to that in a second. What's big problems with the model? Well, a couple of them. One, it violates The uncertainty principle. Why does it violate the uncertainty principle? Well, what Bohr is saying is that an electron is, is proceeding in a circular orbit around the nucleus. We know how to describe things that travel in a circle, right? We know if they're traveling at a certain speed um, that we can predict where they're going because we know they're traveling on this circle with a particular radius. So then essentially what Bohr is saying is, well, we know the speed, and we know the mass, and we know the position of an electron at any given time. 
that violates the uncertainty principle because we know if we know the position of an electron, we can't know its velocity and vice versa. Um, so that's certainly a problem. The other problem with the Bohr model um, is, and I don't know if you've talked about this in physics, but any time a charged particle moves in that way, it generates an electric field and a magnetic field. So an electron that's spinning around like this is generating an electric field in one direction, or in one direction, and a magnetic field in the perpendicular direction. And why that's important is that that's energy that's being emitted. So if that particle is spinning around, it's essentially emitting energy. If it emits energy, it loses energy. If it loses energy, it draws in closer to the nucleus. So if the, the electron were actually spinning around the nucleus, it would sort of be spiraling in and then collapse into the nucleus in like a tiny, tiny fraction of a second. Since we know all matter doesn't collapse into nothing in tiny fractions of a second, um, that can't be right. And actually, they, Bohr knew that at the time. But this was a way to explain um, the observations. The other big drawback to the Bohr model, it only works for one electron atoms. And how many of those are there? Right. So pretty much works for hydrogen, works for helium plus, works for lithium two plus. Um, you know, not that those are real common things. But anytime you have more than one electron in an atom, this model doesn't really work. Um, the, the spectrum that you see is not predicted by the Bohr model. And we'll see that in some of the other lamps we see upstairs. If you look up other uh, atomic spectra of you know, lithium or carbon or whatever, the Bohr model doesn't predict them. Um, and he knew that also. So that's, that's the other problem with it, and that's why we don't really use it. The Bohr model is instructive, and it's a nice beginning to how we think about electrons. But it turns out it's un quite a bit more complicated than that. So instead of an orbit, we call something an orbital. Right. We know it's not an orbit because it's not spinning around the middle. Instead, it's something called an orbital, which is not a specific position, but a probability density. Right. So here's how we get around the, we don't get around, this is how we use Heisenberg's uncertainty principle when we talk about the behavior of electrons. We say, okay, we don't know exactly the path that the electron is taking around the nucleus. We just know that there's a certain probability of finding it somewhere in this space. All right. And that becomes our um, probability, and that becomes our orbital. So instead of an orbit, a specific path, we have an orbital, which is a space that we say we can probably find the electron in. OK, so that no longer violates the uncertainty principle. Essentially, it's this. A trajectory violates the uncertainty principle for a small particle, because we know where it's going, we know where it is, we can trace it along that line. So if you're throwing a ball and you know it's going this way with this speed, right, that's a trajectory. A quantum mechanical probability distribution says, well, we don't know where the electron is that we're throwing at any given time, but we know it sort of takes this path, and at any given time, we can find it somewhere on here. And if we actually zoom in and see exactly where it is, we don't know how fast it's going. If we zoom out, we can look at the speed and just say it's somewhere in this range. So when we look at an orbital, we're looking at a region of space, and we say the electron is somewhere in there. All right. So here are the shapes of the orbitals. And these actually come from equations. So you can uh, use something called a wave function, which is this, this psi wave function. That is an equation that solves a particular problem. We're not going to get into all of that. But there's an equation that can describe the electron, describe the behavior of the electron. And if you square it, you get a probability density or distribution for where that electron would be. Um, and it's a parametric equation, which means it's an equation that can take different numbers in different places. And those parameters are known as the quantum numbers, n, l, and ml. And depending on which numbers you put in that equation, 
you get very different shapes of where those electrons can be. All right. So here's one that's called a 1s orbital. You essentially plot that out and you get a sphere of dots, meaning the electron can be somewhere in there. And because that's hard to draw, we approximate it as just a sphere. It's not actually a hard sphere. It's actually like this. It's a probability distribution. But it's, we can approximate it like that. So instead of saying that we have different orbitals, that is, different specific orbits, or rather than saying we have different orbits that electrons jump to from the inner to the outer shells, what we're saying is they take on different energies, and those energies can, uh, or those orbitals that result can manifest themselves in different ways. So you get the sphere, or you can get the dumbbell, or you can get some of these weirder shapes. And we can describe those more specifically using these three quantum numbers. So an electron has, we can say that an electron has these quantum numbers. That means that its probability distribution will look like one of these shapes or the other. We start with n, which just is 1, 2, 3, and so on. Okay. And that is uh, related to the size and energy of the orbital. And then L is the next one. That actually depends on n. So remember in the video where at the first level there was just a sphere. But then at the second level, you could either have a different kind of sphere or a dumbbell. That's what L tells you. If L is 0, it's the sphere. If L is 1, it's the dumbbell. Um, and then it can go on from there. The thing that's a little bit tricky about L is that we also refer to it in terms of letters. So we talk about S, P, D, and F orbitals. And those correspond to different values of L, L being 0, 1, 2, or 3. And then finally, there's a, a third quantum number, which actually depends on L, that tells us about whether the dumbbell is facing this way, or this way, or this way, or some of the other shapes, which way they're facing. When I say they depend on the quantum numbers beneath them, what I mean is that if you have, if you're in the n equals 1 level, the ground level, the closest to the nucleus, you can only have one possible L because L can only have integer values from 0 to n equals 1. So if n equals 1, then n equals n minus 1 is 0, then L can only be 0. If n equals 2, then L can be either 0 or 1. If L equals 0, you have an S orbital, which is the sphere. If L equals 1, you have what's called a P orbital, which is the dumbbell. All right. And then ML can be anything between L and negative L, including 0. So if L equals 1, then ML can be 1, 0, or negative 1. And that tells you that those dumbbells can be oriented in three different ways. And it looks like this. So here are the three different p orbitals. When L equals 1, you can either have your dumbbell going this way, this way, or this way. The values of ML don't correlate to one of those specifically, but there's just three different possibilities. And then when L equals 2, so now we're out in the third shell, in the n equals 3 shell, we have all these crazy shapes that can start happening. Um, what? Uh, you need to be able to define or to give quantum numbers of the electrons, possible ones. Um, you should know the shapes of the p orbitals. You don't need to know specifically like how to draw the d orbitals. But definitely the p orbitals because we'll get into that uh, when we talk about bonding also. All right, so that's all the time we have here. We'll go upstairs and practice some of these problems related to the quantum numbers and to the hydrogen spectrum. Um, so you can get used to that.